Hey guys, so as you've seen with the intro video, this video is about the chessboard that we've made. So we've created a smart chessboard where you can pick up pieces and then we'll show you exactly what moves a chess piece can make. So in this video, I'm actually going to go into detail the PCB that we created, the schematic, the layout, things like that. So this is an extremely long video, about over 40 minutes. Um, so I'm going in detail with every section of components we used. How they are connected things like that so if that sounds interesting to you then this is the video for you because you'll be able to learn a lot so we're basically making this so it's a nice big pcb chessboard with leds read switches the esp32 things like that we will also make another video part two where we go through the software of it so how the programming worked and also the 3d prints and how we built it together we did not want to make one big video of two hours Felt that's a bit long this video is already a bit long um, so guys subscribe and then probably in a week or two we're gonna release the next part two of this where we talk about the programming so if you need to Altium you can download Altium for free uh, with a link below in our description and also we've got a whole bunch of tutorials on our YouTube channel explaining how Altium works how to create schematics and how just to operate the whole interface so those videos with this video will help you guys a lot to build this chessboard if you guys would like the raw files like i mean the raw pcb uh, project files the code everything please feel free to join our plumpod membership program below so next to the subscribe button you can see the join button when you join you'll be able to get access to all our files um, so we made this video so you can actually build it without these files you can make it yourselves um, but when you join the Plumpod membership, you'll get free access to our Discord, private Discord channel where we can have a chat uh, and then you can get all our files of our projects. So if there's something you would like to do, press the join button below and get the perks. If you guys find this video useful, guys, please subscribe, hit that like button. It helps us a lot. Great. So let's get started. So what I'm going to do first is just, as you can see, this is the top level of LTM design so this is the top level of my schematic sheet uh, if you guys don't know about sheets yet I would strongly advise to go watch a YouTube video we made about creating sheets and putting it together because this is basically the top level where I connect all my different sheets together all my schematic sheets so my LEDs will be here uh, my ESP will be here my port expansion will be here, my read switches here, my voltage regulator and then inside there you'll have the different schematics so if you guys don't understand the sheets yet uh, click on the video in the top right, I'm going to try to put it here get YouTube ready um, and then you'll know what I mean by this connecting them and then I'm going to go through each schematic sheet now uh, explaining what they are, how the components work and uh, why we chose it and how we use it um, so stay tuned for that while I deep dive in every single schematic the first sheet I'm going to speak about is the ESP32 sheet if you guys have been following us for a while you guys know that I really love the ESP32 I enjoy it because it has Wi-Fi Bluetooth all those things for a really reasonable price uh, you can also program with the Arduino IDE so it's very friendly for new users so in my ESP32 I basically have two chips so I've got my ESP32, which will be the brains behind my chessboard uh, that will accept my inputs, it will put on the LEDs and things like that. And then I've got my CP2104. I use this IC because the ESP32 cannot handle a USB directly connected to the ESP2 program it. So we have to convert our USB signal, which is normally D minus D plus, as you can see here, so this is the communication lines coming from my USB and then it outputs my TX and RX which is a normal serial protocol, communication protocol that's well known in the world and with that I can program my ESP32. So it basically takes my USB signal and converts it to serial. So this is a USB to serial converter. And then we've got our decoupling, capacitors, decoupling capacitors uh, like for all our ICs. Uh, normally I do a 10 microfarad and 100 nanofarad and this is just to make sure the power supply here is stable uh, so when we do our PCB design we have to make sure that these capacitors are as close as possible to our IC but the f I would say the six most important signals for this IC is your D minus D plus really be careful and make sure that your D minus go to D minus 
I've made the mistake before where the D plus goes to the minus and I just didn't focus. Um, that's just focus. So if you make the mistake, you're going to have to cut tracks and things like that. Um, also, you have to put D plus D minus in Altium to make a differential pair when you do the PCB. I'll show you guys that later. So you either have a D minus D plus or you put an underscore N or underscore P to make them differential. If you don't know what differential is, we'll get there. Don't worry too much. Um, and then the other four important signals is your RX and TX and your RTS DTR. So your RX and TX is basically your transmit and your receive signals. So transmit means this IC will transmit a signal, a communication, a message to this IC and will also receive it. So this is where you need to focus. So when this IC transmits, then this IC will receive. So my transmit signal from this IC will go to the receive signal of this IC. I hope that makes sense because this one transmits and this one receives. So I normally put a resistor in between so I can name it correctly. So I've got my RX on my ESP and then the TX on my CP. So he transmits and he receives. So this is the same. So my ESP32 transmits and my CP2104 receives. And that is something to focus on when you do a PCB design. Just make sure your TX and RX is correct. Uh, another reason I put a resistor here is if I make a mistake where I can put my TX uh, to the wrong TX or RX, then I can fix it by just jumping resistors across. Because I've not met an engineer who has not made this mistake before where they connect the TX and RX incorrectly. The DTR and RTS is basically just telling the system or the IC I'm ready to uh, be programmed. So if you're familiar with the ESP32 uh, dev board, sometimes you've got those little buttons like you'll see on the top left. And these are normally manually need to be pressed to program uh, to put it in boot mode. So this can be done automatically with this RTS and DTR. I don't want to go too much detail about this. I um, want to keep it easy. So basically this IC will control when we can upload our program to our ESP32. So something will happen here and then we'll either pull my GPO's pin high or low and my reset pin. These are the two pins that are important. And then GPIO0, uh, which is over here, tells my ESP32, okay, are you in programming mode or are you in normal running mode basically? So we need to change the states of these two to program the ESP32. Uh, so normally you can do with buttons like with the dev board you can see here, but this will automatically fix it and you can app, uh, automatically program your ESP32 without any issues. And then we've got a decoupling capacitors for this IC as well, for the ESP32. You have a decoupling capacitor for every IC you have. It's just good practice. And then here you can see the signals. So I've got my IO expanders. Uh, this is the read switches. We'll get there that comes into the ESP32. And then we've got an LED control that outputs to control the light of LED. And then this clock shift, clock enable, is to control the shift registers. Uh, we'll get there in a different sheet. But this is signals goes to 74HC165, which is a shift register, just to control the movements of the bits. And then you can see power and ground. We use this um, yellow square. It's called a port. Uh, to say that these signals are going to go outside of the sheet. So it has to do with our top level sheet like this. These are ports. So we, we're telling the program, listen here, these signals are not on this sheet. It's on another sheet. Uh, I've made a video about this. Please guys go watch that one to get more information about ports and nets and all those things. Now let's look at the 3v3 voltage regulator because we need to get power this 3v3 volts needs to come from somewhere. Let's look at our voltage regulator. So as I said earlier, these are ports. So that's basically telling us that we've got a voltage coming from the outside world. So not on the sheet that will give power to my battery signal. So my bat, uh, why I call it bat is I use this voltage regulator quite often and I've created a sheet that I can re reuse. And normally I use a battery, but in this chessboard I did not use a battery. So you can change this to 3.3 volts, 5 volts, whatever you like. Actually 5 volts from the because this VN comes from the USB. Um, but I just create a sheet that I can keep reusing. Um, so 
I've made a video about that as well, explaining how to reuse sheets and you know, how to implement it in different projects. So if you want to learn more about that, please go watch that video. Um, so this is a very easy circuit. Uh, we use a chip called MIC5219. Guys, just be careful. I think but last week they actually said they're going to discontinue this IC. So we're going to have to find a new IC to be our voltage regulator. We'll probably look at some MCPs or something. So basically what happens is I've just got a input signal which I get from the outside world which is actually my USB signal which is 5 volts and I go through my in and enable so this enable can actually switch this voltage regular on or off I just connect it short straight to my, my top voltage so it's always on so when there is power this IC will be on and then I just input it to this IC uh, I've got a bypass capacitor of 4.7 microfarad. I just use the data sheet. So if you guys open the data sheet of the MIC5219, you will see they give you an example circuit that you can actually use. And then we've got decoupling capacitors as always. And then our output is 3.3 volts. So it's quite easy. I've got the chip that does everything for us. I input 5 volts. I get 3.3 volts out. And then I've just got capacitors that stabilizes this voltage. I also added an LED. So this LED will just tell us, okay, if we have 3.3 volts or not. So it's more for debugging that I know if I plug in my USB connector to the board, I can see, okay, I've got a red light. Uh, it means there's power. You can make this any color, of course. Um, but yes, so it's just for me to know, okay, 3.3 volts is on the board. If I don't see this LED, I know something is wrong over here. And then I output my 3.3 volts out of this page with a port to be used on another sheet if I want to. Like I said, I copy or I reuse a lot of my circuits and this is one way of reusing it, making use of ports. But this is it. Very easy. Input 5 volts, get 3.3 volts out. Now let's look at our LEDs. Now let's look at my favorite LEDs in the world. Um, it's the WS2182B. What I love about these LEDs is with one signal, I can control all the 64 LEDs. I can turn each one on, change each one independently of color, just with one signal line and then the voltage and the ground. So what I have here is ports again. From the outside world, I get LED Plus, which is a battery. Uh, my LED in, which comes from my microcontroller, tells my LEDs when to turn on and what color to be, and then ground. We also have 64 capacitors. So it's good practice to have a capacitor with each LED that you have on the board. So these capacitors will have to be as close as possible to the LED. You'll see on the circuit as well, PCB when we do it. And then we just daisy chain it. So my D out goes to the next one's D in, D out, D in, D out, D in, and so on. So when it gets to the end, I just go D out one. So then that goes in here, D out one. And it keeps jumping like this. And then VDD is just my voltage. So the WS2182B can either be between 3.3 volts, but 5 volts as well. And then VSS is ground. So I'm running this off 5 volts. What I will probably do and with updating this um, program, or some program should I say, that circuit, is actually use the WS2183. So the WS2183 is actually a kind of upgrade. So these pins have a downfall from if this LED, let's say LED D4 breaks, then I will only have these four LEDs that are on. The rest of them will be dead because every single LED needs to work for the next one to work. So if this one breaks, then D16 won't work and every single LED part after it will not work. But with the WS2813, they've got a backup data pin. So this means that if one LED breaks, you can still use the whole um, LED string. Uh, so this is much better. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's definitely more stable. Um, so if one LED breaks, it doesn't ruin ruin your whole day. Because I did have some issues if one LED is broken. You don't know which one it is because all of them will be off. Um, so it gets a bit tricky. But that's it. This is my favorite LED. Um, and just remember, you have to put a 100 ohm resistor in series with the signal uh, for ESD and just for stability. So the in, the out, the in, the out, and you just daisy chain it like this, and you can have as many LEDs as you want. Let's have a look at our read switch circuit. So a read switch is basically just a normal switch that gets activated when a magnet gets either close to it and closes it, 
or away from it and then it's open. So this can see, be seen as a normal switch in the circuit as well. So we have a 5 volts that will have, so what will happen is when we close the circuit, 5 volts will go to our read one out signal and then we've got a pull down resistor. We have this pull down resistor because we want to make sure that our read one out is stable when our switch is open. So when our switch is open, we want to make sure that we are grounded. If this is not here, we don't know what the state of this pin is when this circuit is open. When it's closed, we know it's 5 volts. But when it's open and we don't have a pull down resistor, we are not sure what this will be. Um, and in electronics, you always want to be in control of what your signals are. You always want to know when it, at all times what it will be. So if you're not too sure what it is, pull it down, pull it up. Just make sure you understand the state of your signal. So we did this 64 times. We've got 64 squares on the chessboard. So we just had for every single one, we've got a read switch, a resistor that's a pull down, and then our signal will go out. So we've got another port here. That means it goes away from this page. I will explain more about the ports after we went through every single circuit. So we did this 64 times. So there's one square, one square, another square, and you can see at the bottom, 64 of them. So basically this is what's inside each square, our red switch, a resistor, and then our LED we paired with this as well. Um, so easy circuit, we've got a switch. When we close the switch, we read five volts here. When the switch is open, we read zero volts or ground here. As you can see, we've got 64 switches basically. And our ESP32 does not have so many IOs. So here you can see it's got 35 maybe. So how can we connect 64 of our red switches to our ESP32? We have to make use of shift registers. So next step, next section, I'm going to speak about the shift registers. Let's look at uh, shift registers. So this is quite interesting because this is where the magic happens. Like I mentioned earlier, we cannot connect all our red switches straight to our ESP32. So we have to make use of a shift register. What this chip basically does is it allows for inputs. So we can see it allows for eight inputs and then it will shift it out at my pin 9 QH. So it captures all this data basically, puts it inside the RC and shifts it out. So we daisy chain it, which means we just connect it to one another. You'll see pin 9 goes to pin 10 and we keep adding our signals to it. So we've got our 8 here that goes to our RC. Then you can imagine coming out in pin 9 and then we add more to it, 8. So now in this signal here, we've got these plus these. And the same thing happens over here and this pin 9 to the output. So when you get to here, to, to microcontroller, this signal here actually has all these pins. So it's all these eight signals inside of this one wire. And our microcontroller will decode it and figure out which what is the state of these pins. So that's the idea of a shift register. It takes a parallel input and makes it a serial output. So all this information is in this signal, sing, single, <laughs> in the single signal. <laughs> yeah, it's, so all this information is over there. Uh, so it's just to try to understand the, the, the idea behind it. I'll explain exactly how it works now. But basically what happens is eight in one signal, I add another eight. So I've got 16 here, add another eight. 24 here, add another eight. I've got 32 signals on this one line. And the reason I have two separate ones is the data sheet mentioned that we should not connect more than four shift registers uh, in series next to each other. So I just got two different ones. So how do we control it? How do we tell our IC, listen here, capture this information, shift it out, capture the information, shift it out. We use these three pins. So we've got our load pin, our clock enable and clock. So let's see what needs to happen to these signals to make this work. When we look at the data sheet, it will kind of tell us what to do. So when we look at parallel load, so we need to make our parallel load low to load our information. You can see that the X means that it does not matter what the other state of the pins are, what the other pin states are, it can be anything high or low. So this means my parallel load needs to be low and then I'll load it. So this signal here, needs to be low, then my signals here will go inside my IC. So when I tell my ESP32 to make this low, then my IC says, okay, 
I will take this information, put it in the IC, and you can see these signals are throughout my ICs. So when I make this one low, all these four are low. So they go low, all these signals go in the IC, and it will be loaded there or stored there until we give a new command. Now we want to shift it. So to shift it, we have to make a parallel high. And then here you can see there's no big difference. There's two ways of doing it. You can either use your clock enable low and change the state of your other clock. Or you can keep your other clock low and change the state of your clock enable. So this arrow on top means my signal is going from low to high. We change the state. When you see a H, it means I keep my signal high. When you see a L, it means I keep my signal low. So you can choose which one you do. So basically what this is telling us is we've just loaded our signals into the shift register by keeping this low. Now this information is inside my IC. You can think of it like that. And now I need to change the state of one of these. So let's keep our clock one low and then I change the state of my clock enable. And when I change the state from low to high, my clock enable, it will push the signal out of my number nine. I hope you guys understand. So I first load it into the system, change the state of these pins, and then I push it out. And I just keep doing that to shift it out. And then all our information will go to our microcontroller where we'll be able to read it. And we did the same with this. Initially, I actually thought, okay, I need to split these two. So I thought I'd need to make my clock enable two and clock enable uh, one separate. But I did create a resistor jumper here to short it. This just tells us, okay, if I put a zero ohm resistor here, these two are short. And just with one pin, I control all of them. So this was not necessary. In our, our example that's working, we got clock enable one actually shorted with this so that becomes that so that means when i make this low then this will also be low so this actually equals this when i populate the resistor there so when this resistor is populated clock one is equal to clock two basically so i can control one clock one and it controls everything and that worked perfectly for us so once we got our information then we push it to our ESP32 and you can see two microcontroller one, two microcontroller two and then we use ports again to push it outside to the real world. Now we spoke about all the ports, now let's see how we put it together because I keep speaking about ports going to the outside world but how do I connect it? Well one way to do it is watch this video on the top left, I explain in detail but I'll explain a bit more now uh, how we connected everything together. Now we're back at the top again with our, uh, should I say, sh all sheets connected to our main sheet. And now that you went through all the different sheets, this will make more sense to you. So let's start to the left. So as you can see, this is the LED uh, sheet. And inside here, if we say right click and we say open, you can see all our LEDs. So this is what I meant about the ports. So we've got LED plus, LED minus, LED D in. And this is what you'll see over there, LED plus, LED minus, and LED D in. And this is what I mean by the outside wall coming into our sheet. So I've got five volts connected. So that means that on this point now, I've got five volts. And I've got ground connected there. So at that point, I've got ground. And I've got the LED in coming from my ESP32. So let's just go out a bit. So I've got my... BD in my voltage regulator, five volts, and then I get three volts, three outs. But where does the five volt come from? Let's see if we can find out. So our five volts come here at the bottom. It comes from V bus. So where does our V bus come from? Our V bus comes from our ESP32, as you can see, output to a V bus. So if we open this, and we can see V bus goes to output V bus, and this comes from our USB. So you can look at it like yeah, a chain of events. Uh, you can trace also where everything comes from. So V bus is from a USB, goes there, goes to a port, which is the output to another sheet, which is here. So it goes output V bus, and then V bus becomes my five volts. My five volts then goes there. It also goes to my read switches. It goes to my ports. Uh, it goes to my LEDs. 
So from this we can see that our USB powers our whole system. I did also add an option. I did add an option at the bottom to use external voltage. So if I don't populate this resistor and I populate this resistor, then I can connect external voltage and I don't have to use, use USB. So my thinking was that if I just want to use an external power supply without the USB, I don't need to program it. I just want to play. I can just connect it to external voltage. And then we can see our, let's look at our read switches. Like I said, we've got 64 read switches and they're all output and they have to go to our shift registers. So my read goes out and it goes into my shift register. So this is a nice top look at it. So the top view of it, how everything's connected. You can see read switches is connected, connected to my shift registers. My shift register gets input from my ESP32, right? We spoke about the load and the clock. So my ESP32 controls the load, controls the clocks. Uh, it gets the output from the shift registers. So we've got these outputs, which has our, all our signals on. So we've got all this loaded into our chips. And then two micro one, two micro two will go to the outside world. And that then should go back to our Arduino. So there, there goes the Arduino. If we open this, I know it's a bit hectic guys, but I'm sure you guys understand. And then it goes inside our ESP32. So this is the top view how everything's connected by making use of ports. So just a quick overview again. We've got our voltage regulator. It takes 5 volts to 3.3 volts because our ESP32 needs 3.3 volts. We've got our LED strings, 64 of them. We've got our ESP32, which is the brain behind the project. We've got our shift register because we cannot, or the ESP32 cannot read. 64 switches, 64 inputs, outputs. So we use a shift register to connect it to our ESP32, which is the middleman. And that's it, guys. So with these components, we can build a nice chessboard. So in the next part of the video, I'm going to show you guys how the PCB looks and how I placed everything and why I placed things in a certain position. Guys, as always, if there's any questions about the schematic, please let me know. i uh, be happy to explain it on Discord or anywhere or in the comments. Now let's have a look at how we placed our components on our board. So as an overview, you can see the board has 64 squares and then we've got our LED, read switch, capacitor and resistor all in one square. So the not the most difficult part, but a, a challenging part was to make sure that every single piece is exactly the same spot with respect to its own square. So I actually made a video about this, how to place components perfectly in Altium. Um, so if you just click on the video at the top right or go to the links below, you'll find that video to show you guys how we actually place these components perfectly in these squares. So I want to break it down step by step. So I added my ESP32 on the top left. Um, one of the reasons are that I just want my ESP32 close to the edge. We've got an antenna here for the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and it's always good practice to either have a cutout at the bottom of it or hang it over the edge. And then just our USB that will program it and give it power. So it's always good to have your components placed close to where they have to be. So as we know our USB goes to our CPT104 so they're nice and close. And then we've got our RX and TX here that goes all the way to our ESP32 to program it. When we look at our transistors for the auto upload q1 q2 we'll see they're also kind of in the middle and also nicely closely placed then over here we've got our u10 which is our voltage regulator so you can see we've got 5 volts coming in and then we've got 3.3 volts coming out so that is the same as our schematic here we've got 5 volts coming in and 3.3 volts coming out and then as i mentioned earlier you have to make sure that our decoupling capacitors are as close as possible to our IC. So you can see C71, 72, 73, and we got C71, C72, 73. So these will just keep my 3 volt 3 voltage stable, so there's no ripples, and then we have a decoupling capacitors on our 5 volt side of our voltage regulator. So this is just normal common practice to have your decoupling capacitors as close as possible to the IC. And then on top here you can see when I get my 3 volts, I run it through a resistor and then through an LED to turn on the LED when I have 3 volts. So this is this part of the circuit. Again, I place it as close as possible. I try to keep my tracks as short as possible. That's just nice, good practice. 
And then on the right hand side, I did a thing where I just choose, am I going to use my USB power or am I going to use my 5 volt power? So how I do this is I populate a resistor. So if I populate a 0 ohm resistor on R72, I am using my V bus, which is my USB. If I use populate R73, then I use external voltage, which I can just connect here. So this can be from a power supply or any other 5 volt power that you can get. Uh, don't populate both at the same time and power on the both same time. Uh, that will not end well. And then on the left hand side here, we just have our shorts that we spoke about with our read switches uh, over here. So if I decide I only want to use clock enable one for all my clock enables, so even for the second shift res register pairs, uh, then I just put a zero ohm resistor here. And we actually ended up doing this. So in the program, we only care about load one, clock one, clock enable one. We don't care about the second one. We shorted it, it worked quite well. And then on the top, you'll just see some decoupling capacitors again. So whenever we have an IC and voltage, we make use of decoupling capacitors. And then I reset, uh, we need to populate this to be able to program the board. And that is basically pretty much the ESP circuitry uh, that I use quite often. So whatever I start a project, I will take this kind of as is and just build around it because I know the ESP30 works quite well with the CP2104. And then if I any IoT project with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, I choose the ESP32. Nice and cheap, easy to use. Now let's look at the LEDs. So you can see my LED D1, uh, the circuitry. So we've got 64 LEDs daisy change all connected to each other in series. Uh, as you can see here, I've got my D out going to my D in of the next one, D out to D in. So just things to notice is I've got my 100 ohm resistor in series with my WS2182. Also just good practice, protects it, makes it more stable. What you also have to notice is that my first LED is as close as possible to the pin of the ESP32 that's going to control it. Uh, we don't want it to go all the way to the bottom. So we don't want this to be our first LED. We always want the first LED, LED of the WS2182 to be as close as possible to my ESP. So that's why I chose this one. And then I just daisy chain it D1 to D2, D3 until it gets to the end. So when it gets to the end, I just put it all the way back here. You could have taken it just straight down. What I would have changed is the silk over here. I would probably have made this one and made white play this side, uh, just so that my LEDs actually match this number. Uh, so yeah, that's the only reason. Then with the LEDs, you will see that we've got our capacitors, our decoupling capacitors as close as possible as well. So these are these LEDs, uh, these capacitors, under no referred, so every single LED has one. As you can see there, there, there. So this is basically just connected to the ground and my 5 volts. You will see there's no track here actually, but that's because I've got a copper pore. So if I choose T, G, E, I bring back my copper pore and you'll see I've got 5 volts connected through my pore. So the red part is my copper pore on top. It's just basically copper all over that's connected to 5 volts. So wherever you see the red, you'll see it's connected to 5 volts. So I didn't actually need to place a track from there onto the top there because the copper pore does it. So to remove it again for ease, T, G, H, it shelves it. And that's it. So every capacitor has it. So the LED quite easy. We've got a signal coming to a resistor. The resistor is going straight to our LED and then just daisy change left, right, left, right, left, right, all the way down. And then you'll see the last one has nothing on its pin too because it's not connected to any LED. Guys, that's why it's very important to focus on the schematic because when we have this perfect, the chance of this being wrong is very, very small because it will check that you connected everything properly. We'll do a design rule check after I explain every single section of this PCB. Now let's look at the read switches. So you can see read switches S1, S3. So these are basically magnet sensitive switches. So when you have a magnet on top of it, it will close and then we'll pull down my 5 volts and then I'll get a 5 volt signal here that is going to my, re uh, my shift registers, but we'll get there. So basically it's just I placed a read switch in every single block. So because every block will have its own magnet, 
what I should have done actually is maybe moved it more to the center and move the LED more to the side uh, because now I kind of have to have my magnet off center with the pieces and that's not always ideal. Um, it looks a bit ugly, but we can fix that in version two. So we placed every single research in the exact same position, 64 of them. And then you can see that the output, like we mentioned, we cannot connect 64 re-switches straight to our ESP32. So we have to make use of shift registers. So you'll see that all these outputs, these blue lines here goes to our shift register over here. So let's chat about the shift register. So you can see we had, how many, we had eight shift registers. So two pairs, should I say, because the data sheet mentioned do not do more than four. I think you can, but it's not advised. And let's see how it looks on the PCB. So for this one, I actually put it on the back side of the PCB. Uh, it just looks neater uh, because if I'm on top, I don't want to see the shift registers there. It's at the bottom. So the top one here will have all my, so each row has its own shift register. So we have eight rows. So the first row will go to the first shift register, the second row to the second shift register, and so on. So you'll see, let's take S1, we click on it, we can push tab, tab, and we'll show where it goes. And then you can see it goes straight to my shift register, pin, pin 11. So all our read switches will do this. So it's connected like this. And then the second row will be connected to our second third to the third, fourth to the fourth. We just also discuss the load and the clock, clock enable. So these are what controls it. And you'll see that will be going to my ESP32 over here, load, clock, clock enable. And this will only be the first four. And then I also had for the second one, I had connected a separate one to the ESP. But like I said, I don't actually use this one anymore. So number two, because I shorted over here, my clock one becomes my clock two and I don't have to write code to use clock two. So that's basically my shift registers. I place it at the bottom, one row is connected to the first one, one row is connected to the second one. So it's exactly the same as my schematic. So my first eight connected to one, second eight connected to another, and so on, it's daisy chain. So let's see, we've got pin nine, that should output to pin 10. So where's pin nine? Pin nine is here. If we push tab, it will show us where it goes, and it goes to pin 10, and then pin nine to pin 10. So that's how they connect to each other. That's why it's always important, guys, to have a look at your schematic while doing PCB layout. Doesn't make sense. Am I placing components in the correct place to make it easy for me to root? Things like that. So always have a look at your schematic, how this goes, nine to 10, got re switches here, and then it should all, all be good, all be well. And this yellow stuff <laughs> that you can see lines here are actually silk screen. So this is the pictures or the text you see on top of a board. So if I go in 3D, you will see the white. So that is silk screen. So I made it like this for beginners to know where to place their, their components, place their pieces. So the rook, the knight, the bishop, queen, king, and so forth. It's also just too nice to make the squares with the annotation um, to know where you're moving it, e4, e5. And then I just made a hardware revision here because I will make another one uh, with some updates that I'll be doing on live streams so you guys can see what I'm doing. And then we have some holes, mounting holes, just to be able to lift it off with standoffs. Because as you can see at the bottom, we have some root switches and we don't really want this to be on the ground. So we'll have standoffs in the top there, yeah, just so it can stand off from the ground and the PCB won't lie flat. And we also added each square have its own holes, just in case we want to make little boxes, uh, maybe put some epoxy in it, uh, to diffuse the light, uh, make it a bit more artsy and crafty, things like that. So this is more just thinking about the future, what we can do with each square. Great, so let's just have a quick overview. So we've got the ESP32 on top here, which is our brains. Then we plug it into, we've got a USB on the corner here. We plug that in to give it power, but also to program it. To program it, we go through the CP2104. It will convert our D plus, D minus into a TX and RX. So it's a USB to serial converter. 
and these signals will then program our ESP32. We have our decoupling capacitors as always between our 3.3 volts and ground and then we also have our 3.3 volt regulator taking our 5 volts making it 3.3 volts with our decoupling capacitors. Guys don't forget about those decoupling capacitors. Then in each square we have our LED, resistor, capacitor and switch or red switch and we kind of kept the numbers exactly the same so you know to which one belongs. So don't go and go D1 with SW3 and R7. You'll be able to do that if you change the numbers in schematic, but try to keep it that it makes sense when you look at the PCB. It will make debugging and troubleshooting so much easier. And then we have our shift registers where all our read switches are connected. So this just allows us to have 64 IOs connected to our ESP32. Because as I explained, we take parallel loads and we connect it in serial and then our ESP32 can read 64 just with one, basically one pin, which is quite amazing. So we've got eight of them at the bottom of the PCB. And then we just made it some pretty with some silk screen, try to keep track of what hardware vision is, make it look like a chessboard, put some pieces on for beginners to know how to pack the board. And that's basically the PCB. Really, guys, it was not, it's not too bad. I think all of you can do this. All of you can make this. But if you guys have any problems making this, of course, let me know and I'll try to assist. See what you guys have done. It would be very cool if some of you guys actually build this. That's it, guys. We just made our own hardware for our smart PCB chessboard. If you guys made it this far, I'm quite impressed. Um, you probably skipped through a lot. I doubt many people will sit and watch 50 minutes of making a chessboard. But if you did, congratulations. You will know how to build a chessboard. Uh, like I said, if you guys want the raw files, join our membership below and then you can get all the files. You can have private chats with me in Discord on a separate channel. We've got a free ch Discord channel as well where I do help people. Um, but the Plump Pot YouTube members get their own channel as well. Um, just smaller, more personal. Great. Thanks for joining guys. So see you guys next time for part two of this video where we're going to talk about the software and how all of it works together. How we get the pieces to interact with the read switches and then the LEDs light up to show us where we can move. Remember guys, give a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video and it was helpful. Until next time, bye.